Hello, folks. How are you? We are back after a weekend away, and um, even though we're not new to doing this, we've got a new name. We've been brainstorming, and the name of the show is Heavy Metal Urgy. And um, for our first episode, we're not talking about metal. <laughs> Ironic as that may sound, but um, awkward, awkward. Um. Thank you all for tuning in, and um, we have a very special guest today, a guy I've been meaning to get on for a while now, and it's Mr. Eric Bauer. Mr. Oh, Bauer. Mr. Bauer to all of you. And Eric, it's good to see you, my friend. How have you been? Thanks for having me. Um, I've been okay. I've been um, alive. Perfect. I mean, you know, sweating the, sweating this your ass day and age, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty good, pretty good uh, first step. Um, yeah, we were dreading having to reanimate you if you weren't alive, because that's just a bitch, and it always I mean, goes badly. I might have some more interesting stories if I were dead, but... That's possible. <laughs> There's some things in life that just don't end well. You know, wrecking <laughs> your dad's car, trying to reanimate the dead, eh, you know, the basics. <laughs> bad bad follow-up to Pet Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> the Alan, how have you been? Uh, it's it's been a little bit of a crazy week around here, but we've gotten through it. It's over. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, hang out with y'all and uh, sit here and drink beer out of this uh, cool coffee mug. Um, beer in a coffee mug. I don't huh? want ice water. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It's uh it's swag for uh, old LA band called Graven Image. So sweet. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we already got 15 looky-loos. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My goodness. And uh, tonight... I'm trying, get, I'm trying to get my shit in better reach here. <laughs> Alan Go came ahead. up with a cool idea of um, talking about something a little off our beaten track, about um, showing some non-metal albums that may appeal to people that are into metal. And um, I have been personally fortunate in having friends throughout the years that have broadened my horizons a bit with um, turning me on to different forms of music. And though metal is the 90% um, genre in my collection, it's, it's good to have something else to fall back on when that just doesn't seem like the thing to listen to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But my uh, experience is, Kind of the same, you know, definitely 90, 95% of what I own and what I listen to is heavy metal, but there are times or periods where you're just not in the mood for that. Uh, yeah, I've had, you know, friends and, you know, tape trading colleagues that have, you know, well, they'll send random stuff and you check it out and it's like, that's actually really interesting. And sometimes it, you know, has heavy elements that appeal to you and it. it can also really help you appreciate some heavy metal too. You can start to hear where some bands are getting influences from outside the metal scene, you know, you can appreciate Panopticon, for example, a lot more if you know more about some of the stuff, you know, that Austin has listened to over yep. the years and realize like, Oh, I know where he's getting that from. Uh, it's not something that, you know, just, you know, was created out of thin air. You know, there's an influence from this post-punk band or, you know, this particular, you know, country or rock or folk band. So yeah, it, uh, I think if you're into music long enough, you start to, pick up some influences outside of your genre that uh, not that you're going to stray away from heavy metal, but you'll just, you'll start to pick up on other things that are metal adjacent or that have the same atmosphere or, you know, have, you know, sort of the same energy, you know, there'll be something about certain types of music that will still appeal to a lot of metal fans, even though it's not something that would fall under the umbrella of heavy metal proper. And uh, yeah, when Marty and I thought about doing this topic, the first person that jumped to mind to come help us with it was definitely Eric. Because Eric, I think you're you know definitely recognized as having a very wide and diverse musical palette. So guess, you'd yeah. be absolutely perfect for something like this. I guess. <laughs> We're hoping so. <laughs> How about you, Eric? You got a pretty extensive non-metal collection as well, or is there just a lot of stuff that all kind of inter intertwines? I, yeah, I mean, yes, between, between Nana and myself, yeah, there's, there's a pretty decent amount of non-metal in, in the apartment. Um, uh, 
probably more so in her cubicles than mine or her cubes, uh, the her Kalax uh, section than mine. Um, but I don't know between all between all of our shit and the soundtracks and the tapes and the CDs. There's 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 enough I, enough enough to where I don't really ever get bored listening to anything that I've got here in the house. I've got something to suit most of my moods. Yeah. For the most part. And that's important because if not, you end up getting burned out on one thing. I've got friends that particularly like really fast death metal stuff, stuff like Angel Corpse and that style, and like really super fast shit like that. And they, over the years, they tend to get kind of burnt out and oh, nothing's good anymore type of thing. And yeah. I always thought that that was a very limiting thing to situation to put yourself into you know you gotta love well, I, music i mean it isn't just metal it's you gotta right. love music you know I, I made it harder for myself because i was like initially i'm like oh i got a lot of crust i can maybe pull some of that but then i, I just kind of made the decision to not pull anything really metal adjacent aside from like i think one or two things that are like a little metal adjacent mm -hmm. um but that's like kind of a stretch um so, you know, basically you're not going to see anything with like an HM2 pedal or, you know, like fucking apocalyptic looking album covers with crusty punks and studded jackets on it. Like yeah. not going to happen. Sorry, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might as well start off with you, Eric. Get this party mm -hmm. started. That's you. That's me. Nope, that's you. I take some I'm large. <laughs> large and in charge. That's right. Um, I don't know. This isn't really in any order, and they told me to pull like ten things, but I ended up pulling more than ten things. We all did. Okay. And That's fine. I don't know. My criteria was kind of like something that like I would play for anybody here. You know, what regardless of where your tastes lie, whether you're a metalhead or whether you know you're into like the newest like uh, dream pop or fucking dark wave stuff. Um, so that kind of mentality. Uh, the first thing I kind of thought of, uh, was this. Oh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, the 45 Grave, uh, Sleep in Safety, uh, album. This is not vinyl, nor is it a, an original, I don't think. Um, but this is, uh, I believe their first full length after a few EPs and demos. Um, and this stuff is great. It's dark, it's brooding, um, Clearly, as you can see from that album cover, they deal with themes that, I don't know, I feel are pretty safe uh, to, to throw across the desk of anybody into death or black metal, um, sort of. I mean, if you like fun, I guess. Although the, the, the real like misnomer of this album is that musically, it's, it's, it's extremely fun, but lyrically, it's, it's dark as fuck. Um, Especially their most well-known track, Party Time, which was on the Return of the Living Dead soundtrack. Um, and I urge you, if you go to check out that track, listen to what she says during that song. And it's fucked up. It's up there with some of the most fucked up lyrics that Cannibal Corpse put out um, in terms of that kind of topical material. Um, yeah, that was kind of my first, my first choice. And where I kind of went, uh, this is going to be all over the place. This is not really to be indicative of everything that I pulled. Mm -hmm. no. um, but yeah, cool this, this, this material is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's fun. It's sing-along stuff, but it's also super dark and grim. Yeah, excellent choice. I don't know a ton of their catalog, but I've you know I've heard enough here and there to know that they're a pretty cool and interesting band. It, they I didn't think of them at all for this, but yeah, that's that's a great one to start with. I dare you to listen to the track Riboflavin and not have it stuck in your head for like two weeks afterwards. <laughs> All right, That's awesome. Alan. Okay, so yeah, I kind of used some of the same criteria you did, Eric. I wanted to think of things that you know people would describe as heavy, but would never describe as heavy metal, and things that you could play for people if they wanted. You know, sometimes people will say like, "I'd like to hear something heavy, but I'm not a heavy metal fan," and. Uh, Whenever people ask me about that, it's like, what should what should I listen to if I want a, a heavy experience? Uh, I give them the finger, the bad motor <laughs> finger. 
This is the first one I usually go to for that kind of sound. Uh, it's the Sound Garden. Uh, this is my favorite by them. It is the best example of something I've heard that is very, very heavy on a lot of the songs. But yeah, the, the band is, you know, obviously not a you know heavy metal band. But you know, some of the riffs and stuff they use, even on some of the you know songs that were big radio hits like Outshined, those are very, very heavy riffs they are playing. Super heavy. Yeah. Uh, you know, the song, you know, uh, Room a Thousand Years Wide, that opening riff on that could have been on any kind of Candlemas, St. Vitus album you've ever heard, and you wouldn't even think twice about it. It, it would fit perfectly. And, I mean, Soundgarden was just a good band. Chris Cornell had a great voice. Uh, you know, they had a varied songwriting approach. They could write songs that would be popular. They could write songs that were, yeah, it would definitely, you know, more you know quirky or alternative by early and mid 90s standards but you know they did a lot of interesting stuff they were a band that were equally informed by like black sabbath the stooges and the sonics along with Mm -hmm. everything else that was going on in the region at the time which is the sound of music that i kind of grew up with Mm -hmm. um, given you know the location in the region um that wasn't my first sound garden but that's a perfect record in my opinion they never topped it um, no, and no, they no, never, no. they ne- didn't put out anything better than that. I, my exposure to them started with, um, louder than love, which I also love not quite as much as bad motor finger. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think they're both great records. And I think that's like the era of sound garden. I don't like anything that they followed that record with super yeah. unknown. I fucking hate the song spoon, man. I hate I- spoon, man. Yeah, I, I, I didn't it. like the song much, and they played it to death, which made me hate it. Just well, that and Black Hole Sun, they, Black every Hole five Sun, minutes it was on song. MTV. It was so fun. Yeah. Black Hole Sun, it's a dark track, but it's so like just radio-ready and not like catchy in a way mm-hmm. that like I want an album to be catchy. Yeah, um, and, it, and it just got played too much. I just I never need to hear that song again. No. <laughs> I just don't. But yeah, the tone, yeah so. the tone and production on Bad Motor Finger just perfect. <laughs> Yeah, kids. yeah, it's a it's a, a great album. It's one. I mean, I've been listening to it for thirty years, and it will consistently get a few plays uh, here and there. It's it never sits on the shelf untouched for years, gathering dust. It always comes out to at least play a few songs here and there. So that's uh, that's my opening salvo. All right, Marty, nice right, choice. Your turn. This might be considered as metal adjacent, but it really isn't metal. And Rainbows Rising. Huh. This, this to me is Ronnie James Dio's best performance. I mean, I love him in Sabbath. I love some of his solo stuff, but this album, oh my God, especially Stargazer. Yeah. Absolute, that's the, the feeling and passion in his vocals and the music. I mean, basically the Richie Blackmore was obviously pissed. He wasn't in deep purple anymore. So he made a deep purple band. Essentially, this is a better deep purple to me. And, um, you know, Long Live Rock and Roll is also a great album, but I think Rising is just a bit, has better songs all the way through it. Dio shines. And, you know, I mean, I think this is a pretty obvious one for a metalhead to get into because, you know, Dio is known as a metal guy. And this is still kind of hard rock to me and with a big, you know, deep purple influence with the keyboards and stuff. But it's also the second best record that came out the year I was born. What was the first one? Sabotage. All right, that, that's my favorite Ozzy album, actually. That is my favorite Ozzy Sabbath album for sure. And um, but this is great. If you have not heard Rainbow, check out the Dio years. It's all quality. You won't be sad, and it will not be too far of a straying off the path of metal for sure. No, I mean, it, it's Dio, and yeah, and Stargazer also. is one of those classic songs that you really should know if you're going to be a fan of heavy music of any kind. Um, it's, just, it's just, it's an incredible song. That record's just so good. Just the, the, the tracks musically and, and how the, the instrumental parts are arranged. And then Dio's voice, I don't think he's ever been better honestly than he was on rainbow rising. In my opinion, it, I know there's one a lot of, of there's, people have a lot of love for the early Dio albums and you know, his work with Sabbath, but mm-hmm. rising is just so great. Yep. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely one of his top performances. Yeah. A funny thing with a uh, funny aside with the song stargazer um, or sorry. Yeah. 
Um, Chris Black's uh, band Pharaoh did a song that's re- that called "By the Night Sky" on I think their second album, and it's conceptually very very similar to the story in Stargazer. And like when he had, when the album came out, I was talking to him about. It. I was like, "Yeah, I really like you know the little you know rainbow tribute y'all put into you know the album." And he's just like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And was like, "Stargazer. It's you know you built this one song that's you know the same story as Stargazer." And he just went. Oh crap! We did. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> I'm like, dude, yeah. how did you not know this? <laughs> it, it, the musically, it's different, but it's the exact same concept. Uh, you know, it's just like I, I, I would have paid you money thinking that. Yep, this was just meant to be an homage to Rainbow, and apparently, it just went right over their head. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, Eric, <laughs> back. Shit, back to the attack. Uh, it rotates too fast, man. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, keeping kind of with what Marty just showed is this record right here. Gold by uh, The Fucking Am, which is a collaboration of the bands Trans Am and The Fucking Champs. And oh, yeah. Trans Am were a, like an electro rock band in the late 90s, early 2000s. And the fucking champs were basically the same era, but they were like more of a just straight ahead rock, hard rock type band. Um, and this material basically combines their styles into a single album. And just if you go off of the first three tracks, it's like straight up Thin Lizzy worship with a little bit of Deep Purple thrown in there, but just as much Gary Newman and Devo influence over the whole affair um it's fucking great and it's got moments where it's heavy and brooding um the lyrics are kind of goofy uh but you know that's part of its charm uh i mean look at those guys you know they don't look like they're taken much seriously i'm about (laughs) that um really cool shit and uh i've been rocking this actually for a few days um it's just great uh, the the classic rock hard rock influences are strong um, and they don't sound I think for me one of the things that makes this album as good as it is is that it doesn't ever sound like derivative or like it's a clone or like they're just copying somebody else's style for the sake of a record um, it sounds very much uh, like an homage but like a very loving and thought out uh, well considered homage to the era that it came from um i think i think anybody watching this channel might find something to enjoy off of this even if it's just like a riff or a couple riffs or like a passage in one of the tracks it's this is great stuff hmm. sounds really neat i'm not familiar with that one the <laughs> fucking am they have one I, of the best names ever too so i had a couple champs or one fucking champs album and i really liked it musically but man i needed vocals i mean it was all instrumental right after. right that's not uh trans am has a vocalist and i'm pretty sure it's the guy from trans am doing vocals over the album but it's both full bands as far as i know just jamming on one record it's it's great cool sweet yeah, Alan. i'll have to keep that in mind ah my turn okay all right let's go in a little different direction <clears throat> this is one a lot of heavy metal fans like and it's a great album, but I'm always surprised that heavy metal fans gravitate towards it so much. It's uh, Endless Skies by a band called Ashbury. Uh, this came out in 83. It is it's sort of, it's a southern hard rock album. It, it, it has a lot more in common with things like, you know, Almond Brothers, you know, little hints of Charlie Daniels band at times. Um, you know, there's some 70s hard rock influences too, but it's very, very southern flavored. And it's always been one that a lot of metal fans will just absolutely swoon over for some reasons. I think part of the appeal for the heavy metal crowd is that the cover art, the cover <laughs> art is part of it. And but the cover art does convey there is uh, there are a lot of you know the typical fantasy themes. There's a lot of wizards and magic men and you know swords, um, but it's you know it's not done through the you know u.s 80s power metal lens it's more done through like the early uriah heap 
kind of storytelling. They don't sound like Uriah Heep, at least not in my opinion, but they've got that same sort of you know fantasy cinematic vibe about the way they write lyrics and sing. Um, it's a killer album. Uh, I've had it for years, and yeah, just like everyone else, like, I'm surprised how much I like this, but I really, really like this. And, and again, there's no reason they would have a heavy metal following, but they've been invited. They've played it like the Keep It True Festival, and they get an incredible reaction. Wow. Uh, they sell tons of merch when they play those kind of things. And apparently it was kind of a surprise even to the band members. It's a pair of brothers you know, who are kind of you know, the, the core of the band. And you know, they were kind of caught off guard too. It's like, why are you inviting us to play this kind of festival? <laughs> really? You guys like us? It sounds like that'd be like team yeah, blood rock yeah. at a festival like that. Yeah. yeah, people people just fawn over them. So they've gotten back together. They've you know recorded some newer stuff in more recent years, and it's really good. You know, it's not one of these just oh, let's throw back and do a few more tracks to cash in on our fifteen minutes. The new stuff they've done is incredibly good. It's very much in the same vein. Uh, it sounds like they haven't missed a beat, even though it's been almost forty years since this came out. So, yeah, if you, if you know, sort of fantasy themed southern hard rock music, uh, gets your interest, or yeah, this dude right here, uh, he's the main character in the uh opening track. Yeah, th this is a definitely a band to check out. The original album's kind of a bitch to get, but it's been reissued. Uh, I think High Roller did it, so it's not hard to you know get a copy of this and track it down. So I'll go, uh, we'll go down south with uh. Ashbury. I don't think they are from the South, though. If I remember right, they're actually from like Arizona or New yeah. Mexico. So yeah, it's got Southwest. Southwest. Yeah, it's, it's Southwest, and it's got and it does have hints of that, you know, just little hints of that kind of what you might associate with you know, Southwestern rock, where it's got it's got that kind of you know melancholy open landscapes, lone guy hitchhiking down the endless highway in the middle of the desert kind of thing going on. But there's also swords and wizards and magicians and shit. So. It's a cool listen. Sweet, never even heard of it. it it's it's one of and you new. Know, if you're, it, you're it, depending on how it's listed, a lot of folks would overlook it because it could get listed as just yeah, you know, Southern Hard Rock, C. Leonard Skinner. Which your description Skinner is not a good comparison. Of, for makes them me at think, all. Your description kind of makes me think of Cactus. Cact, I'm, I'm not like real familiar with Cactus. Cactus. That album has been having a bit of a renaissance mm -hmm. lately. I've seen it come up on the VC like three or four times in the last couple weeks. Huh. Yeah. I'm not real familiar with them, but I think it'd be, it's much closer to that kind of thing than it is Skinner. Skinner would be a, a, a terrible comparison for what they're doing. Almond brothers, you're getting more into the right zip code. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going with a project that has a guy that is very well known in metal circles, but um, this is far and away from metal. This is Dan Swano's, side project nightingale this is the very first album he put out and it was just him in a drum machine basically doing his best impersonation of sisters of mercy and um basically the song on spectral sorrows what was it um sacrificed it's very much in that vein it's the same kind of sisters of mercy feel the songs are really good it's a concept album it's just a good Sisters of Mercy worship style album, except I think the songs may have a little more twists and turns than um, Middle Era Sisters did or early Sisters stuff. But yeah, I mean, this is the only of uh, the Nightingale stuff that got project got a lot more proggy when he got his brother involved and other musicians turned out to be kind of a prog rock band. But this is far in a way very different from that straight up. Sisters of Mercy's Worship, Dan Swano from Edge of Sanity, and a bunch of other projects that you probably all know all so well. Yeah, I never checked out. I know of that project, but yeah, I never actually got around to checking that one out. Bad on me. And Eric. <laughs> okay, um, so this one, I guess, is a little bit of a cheat because it is a little metal adjacent. In that I'm pretty sure all of these people involved in this project are also in a black metal band. Um, black metal band called Tombs. And this would be uh, Dreadlords with their Death Angel LP. Um, which was put out on 
uh, not just religious music, which is the old label that King Dude used to run. I don't know if it's still functional or active. Um, and what you have here, rather than black metal, is a very lo-fi, ambient, noisy uh, dive into uh, their interpretation of Delta Blues. Huh. huh. Um, at times sounds very reminiscent of uh, moments of like Danzig 2 uh, mm -hmm. specifically. Um, just if you need like a reference. Um, but just imagine, you know, that production value that Danzig 2 has and then subtract about 100 from that. And uh, you have kind of like the overall ambience of this record. Um, there's always like a hum or a crackle um, kind of overriding everything. It's not a record for everyone, especially if you're not into Delta Blues, because that's ultimately what this record is. It's, it's very dark. Um, you know, they kind of take some of that like Robert Johnson material and amp it up by about a thousand um, in terms of uh, topical material on here. But yeah, it's good shit. Uh, they just put out a new record like a year or two ago. Uh, CD only, which I've yet to pick up. It's a little bit more refined, a little bit more country. Um, huh. This is just straight up like swampy hillbilly music, just kind of with a black metal filter. Huh. Crazy. Yeah. Delta and blues were not the two words I thought you were going to end that sentence with whatsoever. <laughs> But yeah, that's really interesting. I, I'm yeah, I've heard some tomb stuff, but I had no idea they had that kind of project going on too. That's really neat. Alan. Okay, uh, we've already done a couple of sort of uh, '70s flavored things, and some of these references came up. So, <clears throat> going to pull one of my favorite '70s rock bands. Never hear anybody talk about these guys, but they did some very cool stuff. They they had a very short run, uh, I think, is why maybe they get overlooked. Uh, Stars, Coliseum Rock. Uh, this was a band out of the Jersey area. They put out four albums. They were on a big label, but they put them out like in within three years. So it was just like bam, 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 bam. They had several lineup changes along the way, so they had trouble nailing down a uh, you know a steady lineup, and they just kind of fell apart after this one. But you know this was their fourth and last, and in my opinion, the best album they did. Uh, it's a kind of name and logo that if you see it in the used record store, you're going to flip right past it thinking it's just, you know, some very random schmo 70s radio arm. Yeah, it, but it's not. Um, the best way I can think to describe them, they're kind of a mix of the better parts of Boston and Thin Lizzy, but they have a, also kind of a strong pop commercial sensibility about the music. Um, They've got some of the same attitude and swagger that classic Thin Lizzy does. You know, great guitar, very catchy, very sort of urban, streetwise mentality in the uh, songs and the storytelling. But yeah, the, you know, very, very catchy, very hook-laden. Uh, lots of these songs could very easily, if they'd gotten just a little bit of a break somewhere, they could have churned out a lot of radio hits with a lot of these tracks. Um there's lots of influence on here from, you know, classic rock and roll. Uh, you know, lyrically, you will hear snippets here and there that could be straight out of a Bo Diddley song or an Elvis song or something, you know, a Gene Vincent and the Blue Cap song. You know, they definitely, you know, had grown up during that era. Uh, it's really fun music. This is very much the kind of thing you just want to crank up and play really loud. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. It's not as intricate or as you know, deep as a Thin Lizzy album, but uh, it, it, again, it kind of, you know, hits that same spot, and they did really good. They had a really charismatic front man named Michael Lee Smith. Legend has it that, uh, you know, somebody for Van Halen kind of picked up on the three-name thing and stuck Lee in the middle of his name as well, based on seeing this guy perform. Uh, so, yeah, there's all kinds of, you know, they're very much one of those bands that were kind of right on the cusp of making it, you know, you know, into that you know, sort of next tier layer level and just didn't quite get there at the time. But uh, this this was also kind of famously one of the things that uh, Brian Slagel did one of the first CD reissues of a lot of the Stars albums. 
he was a huge fan of the band. Him and Lars uh, Ulrich reportedly were you know huge fans. One of the albums that he kind of bonded over was this one I'm holding, Coliseum Rock. Uh, there, I remember reading one interview with one of the guitarists or something. He was like, yeah, Lars used to talk about our album all the time, and they never once played a cover song. <laughs> if they had only done that, we could have got some more attention. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if if you like that, you know, Thin Lizzy style of just, you know, really good, top-notch 70s hard rock stuff, mix in again. There's one song on here that's just, you know, dead on Boston worship. Maybe they broke up because Boston sued them for copyright, because that's really close. But it's really, really good. Uh, this is a band. Don't uh, ignore the kind of generic name and the cheesy <laughs> logo, and, and give it a try. Because it, I was, really I, I'm going to be honest. If I was flipping through the CDs at my local, I'd see that and just keep going. Yeah, me too. Oh yeah, I, and I did for years because uh, <laughs> I remember when it came back out on Metal Blade, and I was you know would look at it and just be like, why the hell did they put something like that out? But I hadn't actually heard it. I was just judging it based on the way it looked. And uh, this is America. It, was, it was a friend of mine. Judge and, a book by its cover. It, very much, very much. It was a friend of mine over in uh, Scotland, uh, Graham, who you know we've sent music back and forth to one another for a decade or more now. And you know, it, it came up at one point. He's like, "Have you ever heard Stars?" I'm just like. Oh, I remember the name, that really lame kind of name and logo. He's just like, <laughs> oh, sweet child. Just, you know, just, he's like, here, just listen to this uh, one. Trust me on this. And if you don't like it, fine, but you're going to like it. And uh, when, when when Graham does this, you know, oh, you know, bless your heart, child voice. I'm like, <laughs> yes, sir. Let me shut up and listen to what you're recommending. Because I, I, I have learned to trust your judgment. And your uh, I wrote back. I could not stop. He probably got sick of me ranting and raving about the band after that. Because, yeah, I just had to soak it up. And one last aside. For a long time, their stuff was hard to find on YouTube. Whoever had the copyrights was very actively making sure people were not posting songs or videos for stars. But I think they've relaxed on that in the past a couple of years because I'm seeing more stuff pop up. So it's a lot easier to tr to hear online than it used to be. So you should be able to check it out uh, pretty effortlessly compared to even three years ago when there were like two videos from some Russian channel were about the only thing even posted on YouTube. But yeah, stars don't overlook it. It's, it's a good, it looks like a uh, reject with Jeffrey cover art. <laughs> All their record covers were terrible. The name was terrible. The logo was terrible. But damn, those guys can rock. Huh. All right, Marty. Oh, it's me. It, it's you. You can't. You don't. No skipsies. Shit. Well, since I already talked about Sisters of Mercy, I might as well get this out of the way. Yep, they're asking for it in the chat. So, yeah, uh, Jeff wanted that. <laughs> this yep. uh, is their first full length, and probably my favorite. I do like Floodland a lot, but it gets if you're not in the right mood, it's kind of repetitive. Yeah. But um, this is a little bit more band-oriented, even though they stuck with the drum machine on this one, Dr. Avalanche. But, um, yep, English, goth, well done, dark, miserable vocals. Andrew Eldritch's vocals are very dark and low-register, baritone style. Um, it's just it's really good. Songs like Walk Away, uh, Marianne, really great song. Yep. Um, Black Planet, all this shit's it's just really good and solid. Their earlier stuff is like really minimum. Um, you can tell it sounds like it's just him with the drum machine. But he got a band for this one. I think the member, some of the members of this splintered off and to do the mission, the mission UK. Yeah. Uh, which I have not checked out yet. I had a friend that was way into them and I never Dude, I'm probably going to eventually, but the first two Mission UK albums are like essential if you like that type of shit. Yeah, and I do. And I'll, I'd say the first three, actually. Even probably the first Mission album after they had to take the UK off of their name. Yeah. Yeah, Wayne. You know, like, they started as the Mission and then they added the UK. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to them, Eric. We'll get to them. I oh, promise. okay. <laughs> it, 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 it's coming. All right, Eric, you're back. Shit. <laughs> the bed. All right. I'm just kind of going all over the place here. Uh, so I pulled... Robert Calvert, Captain Lockheed, and the Starfighters, which is an album from 1970, like seven or 78. Um, this album consists of 
Robert Calvert, who was a member of Hawkwind for a good amount of time. Uh, Lemmy is on this record. The majority of the Pink Fairies are on this record. Uh, Brian Eno is on this record. And uh, fucking uh, Arthur Brown is on this record. Wow. Holy shit. And this record, sound, like if you like Hawkwind uh, and you like Motorhead and you wish that Hawkwind often sounded more like Motorhead, uh, this album is for you. It's, it's a space rock record, but it's also a concept record about Germans trying to buy um, aircraft post-World War II. There's some pretty hysterical skits between basically every track on here that are reminiscent of uh, like Monty Python type shit. Um, it's a really, really fucking good record. Um, Alan Davey, I think, also had a little bit of involvement in this. Um, he is one of no, wait, he's not listed in the credits, but his psychedelic warlords did do a full live rendition of this LP. Um, this record is awesome, it's uh, super spacey, driving, pulsing, rock and roll, space rock, synthy. I don't know, I mean, it's it's all over the place, but it's awesome. Never that sounds that sounds really cool. I have never ever heard of that. And with that, with so many big names on it, I'm surprised it's not mentioned a ton. He had a second album, which is not quite as good, which has almost as good of a name. Um, let me find it uh, because it's too good not to mention. Um, let's see. Uh, da -da -da. He had an album called. Oh God! This is going to be an issue of like letting Eric find some fucking tidbit that's not even important for the. Uh... <laughs> no, no worries. I don't. It was about like Vikings. Um... Do do. Here we go. This will this will tell me. Lucky Leif and the Long Ships. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not as good. Not as spacey. Decent hard rock record. I think there's less involvement from other players and other projects. Um, I think one of the things that makes this album stand out, honestly, is the presence of Brian Eno. And it's funny because uh, he's not actually credited uh, in the credits. The uh, The Brian Eno credit is Brian Peter George St. John La Baptiste. And his credit is nothing. There's nothing next to his name. <laughs> Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Longer. Brian Peter George St. John La Baptiste de La Salle. Uh, synthesizer and electronic effects. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's fucking great. That's I think neat. both of you probably dig it. That's Human neat. falafel, that's the point of these things. I'm glad you're finding out things that you never heard of. I'm, me too. I'm learning right along with you. Yeah, B between Lemmy and Arthur Brown, I'm kind of amazed I've never heard of it. That's cool. Alan, i am got you this time. Okay. Well, uh, yep, let's follow up on what uh, Marty had mentioned and uh, Eric preluded. M the Mission, uh, also a.k.a. The Mission UK, because anything from you know the UK imported into America for at least half the 1980s had to have the letters UK added to the end of it for reasons. Eh. But, There's um, probably another mission band that threatened being suing them. They, they, I think everybody was just afraid that there was going to be, or that they also maybe wanted to cash in on that sort of exotic factor of you know new wave of British jangly goth post punk pop whatever you know whatever it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, the connection here and why Eric was you know very astutely comparing it to Sisters of Mercy is you have a former Sisters of Mercy, you know, members here with uh, Wayne Gussie. And um, so, yeah, there's stuff. It's similar to Sisters of Mercy, but a little more, I'd say you know, the songs are structured to be a little bit more, uh, you know, commercially successful is not quite the right way to phrase it, but they're definitely more, songs that could have, I'm a sorry. More go rock, a little more Look, rock. A little more rock, a little more straightforward. Things that you know, had a much better chance of getting some airplay. Uh, you know, they were open to that. But um, 
And personally, I like Wayne's voice, you know, a lot more than Eldritch's. You know, he has a he can sound very sad. He has a very warm tone when he needs it. I think uh, Wayne had a bigger, a broader, a broader uh, tone. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely did. And as Eric said, any of their albums are really good. This is the second one, Children. It's the one I'll probably I play the most. I would guess. But any of their stuff is really good. Um, they did a lot of cover songs, and they usually do very good covers. They have a couple of songs every now and then. They will blatantly sort of rip something off. They have one later song that uh, is a dead ringer for The Cure's Pictures of You, but it works really, really well uh, you know, with Wayne's interpretation of it. So, yeah, if you like those, you know, if you want something that sounds you know, like a more, you know, yeah, sort of rock-oriented sisters of mercy with a better vocalist at least in my opinion the mission is one of those don't flip past it and don't confuse it with mission of burma nothing to do with mission from burma i know nothing about that band except they always get thrown in the same little card divider in the ucd store two completely <laughs> separate bands I don't that they could mission to burman may be great i just don't know but they, mission of burma they, were like a jangly sst post hardcore band Okay, they they whatever they are, they, it's not the same band. So don't get yourself tripped up. You want the mission slash the mission UK, and you know, they hung around. They came back. You know they did albums in the nineties even, and even the ones I've heard from that era are still pretty good. So even if you just find one randomly and it's a few bucks at the CD store, don't be afraid to give it a blind buy, even if it's not their best album. Uh, it'll probably be worth checking out. All that mission stuff is cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's never, never it's never blown up in price like say the chameleons um, and their we'll first LP. <laughs> um, we will get to them too. <laughs> uh, and people just haven't caught on, kind of like yeah. with uh, um, fuck man. Uh, there's a lot of bands that kind of fell mm -hmm. into that unfortunate like yeah. really good, really worth your time. And for whatever reason, people just never latched onto it. Yeah, they they just got. I think they just, some of these bands just got really lost in the crowd. You know, we we see it happen with heavy metal bands all the time, and it happens in other genres too. That some bands yep. they were great, and they were just, it was the, there was the wrong time to get noticed. It seems to me that Mission stuff was pretty mass produced. It was on a bigger oh. label, wasn't it? That's probably another reason why it isn't. Was it Geffen? that expensive? I think uh, it was a big label. This one's Mercury. Yeah, Mercury. Yeah. That's another reason why it's not as uh, pricey. I think could be, and, and sometimes you know that does you know backfire on a band later too. That being on Mercury is like, oh, that's not you know true underground cult enough for me to check out. You know, I, I want the you know handful of Snowdrop CD on Celeste de Mort instead. Hey. I, I don't want something on Mercury. Mercury yeah. put out some Motorhead shit, man. Nothing yep. wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. Mercury put out you know classic Scorpions albums. Uh, yeah, you can't uh, you can't just discard. You can't dismiss everything just based on it being on a big label. All right, Marty, I've ranted and praised the mission enough for now, so back to you. Well, this is a band within the last four years or so I've started getting into, but this was my gateway into them. That's a great fucking record. Then Lizzie, Thunder and Lightning, oh. this is probably considered their heavy metal record, even though it, it's not. It's just a little more energetic than their other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what a great record. I mean, Thunder and Lightning... The Sun Goes Down, such a great fucking song. I mean, he was a truly genius songwriter, and I'm slowly, as they turn up, I mean, I paid six bucks for this record. It's worth every penny. And I'm fine. I got Johnny the Fox. I've got Jailbreak. I'll get their other stuff as I go along. But this album was a good introduction, and um, if you're a metalhead, there's probably not a reason, not a lot of reason to not like this, because it's... Mm -hmm. It's got the energy. It's got really interesting song structures. It isn't just typical pop stuff. It's very well written and considered. Great mm -hmm. melodies. Great. It's not. It's not twin. Jailbreak Part Two. No, no, it's great twin lead guitar. You know, harmonies. What the band is known for. Yeah. Um, great album. Yeah, that's. Uh, I had pulled this one for Johnny the Fox. Lizzie, yeah. uh, with Johnny the Fox. It's my personal favorite, but the one you pulled there is. It is probably the one that would appeal to heavy metal fans more because it's the one album they it's their last studio album 
and yeah. it's the one that did really update their sounds and you know have a little more energy and a little more punch to it to fit into that was, know, early 80s scene who was the guy that they brought on for that record from like was he from fucking deep purple or white snake gary moore gary that moore that's mm -hmm. it yeah 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 but yeah it's it's a killer album it's very good it, you're hard pressed to go wrong with thin lizzie albums but yeah that one's got a lot of great stuff on it it's a shame that they didn't get to follow it up. You know, it showed a lot of potential that they they were making that transition, like you know, uh, Scorpions and some other bands were, where they were you know updating their sound with the change in the times, and they showed that yeah, they were going to be able to do it successfully, but they they didn't get to follow that one up. All right, Eric. Okay, Zillatron. Which is Bootsy Collins. Oh, right on. <laughs> oh. Um, and this album is one of those like 90s Funkadelic adjacent projects that Axiom were putting out all the time. This album's got not just Bootsy Collins on it, but Bill Laswell, Bernie Worrell, Buckethead. Grandmaster Melly Mel, Umar bin Hassan, fucking Mama Collins. There's so many people involved in this record. It's it's ridiculous. Um, you will hear a lot of stuff that is kind of a callback to the early Funkadelic sound, like Maggot Brain type shit, um, as opposed to when they went more disco a little bit later in the 70s and the early 80s. Um, but you'll also hear like, um, and a lot of this comes from, I think, Bootsy's and Bill's and Buckethead's and Bernie's involvement in um, fucking uh, Praxis. Um, so you'll hear a lot of drums reminiscent of like Mick Harris, circa his time in Napalm Death. Um, it's fucking great. It's like, it's like. If, if you were to take a Funkadelic record and add grindcore elements to it. Wow. For lack of a better way to describe it. Um, and Bootsy's just like, this is his record. So he's all over the place on here. Oh, he's a uh, great bass player. If, Holy shit. If, you, if you have an issue with Bootsy, you're probably not going to like this record, um, despite how musically freaking broad it is. Um, but it's heavy. It's, it's catchy. It's... Uh, it's very colorful, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's got Bootsy just basically being a fucking maniac in the uh, in the album. Um, it's great shit. Nice, interesting. Don't know that at all. Most of those same people went on to do what is considered the last Funkadelic record, which was the Axiom Funk album called uh, Funk Ronomicon. Um, which has a lot of similar <laughs> elements to uh, to this album. Unfortunately, I don't know that this has ever been released on vinyl. I would love to have a wax copy of this, but I've never seen it. If one exists, I don't know about it. Mm. Alan. Mm. Get some more beer out of my coffee mug here, and uh, let's load up another one since... Uh, Eric also segued towards this one. Let's go ahead and, yeah, talk chameleons. Uh, another one of these, you know, again, chameleons or chameleons UK, in that same time frame of things getting imported from the UK and having to have UK added to the end of the so name. Goofy. For, so goofy. Always did it. But um, this is one of my favorite albums from that whole sort of post-punk scene. Um, that's a that's a phenomenal record. That. One of the best goth records ever. Yeah, and it's goth. It is some of the stuff on here is as dark as anything you'll hear on any weird, you know, DSBM album or stuff like that. Um, there's just some really. I mean, it's at times it's almost just like paranoid-inducing isolation, really mentally crushingly dark. Um, in a way, it's it sounds like Joy Division lyrics read to me sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the guy's got you know kind of a deep, you know, a little more of a baritone uh, voice, 
the production on this thing is amazing. It's crystal clear. They have that very typical early 80s British kind of jangly guitar tone. Every note just is perfectly crystal clear and just hangs in the air. And yeah, this some of this stuff is just completely really like, you know, uh soul crushingly dark, you know, they're um but it's not all that way. You know, there are some songs that are a little brighter and a little more pick me up. So the the album it's not a downer from start to finish whatsoever. Um, but yeah, highlights on this one. Don't fall is really good. Uh, here today is just bleak as like, we're talking like the cure pornography level bleak. Oh yeah. I try to reference something people might know better. Uh, Less than human is one of those songs that just, you want to go out and just start cutting after you listen to that song. It, it's just depressing. Alan, but have you heard the Virgin done. Prunes? What's that, Eric? Have you heard the Virgin Prunes? I have not. I know the name, but I've never checked out their stuff. They were Irish. They came about the same time frame as Chameleons and really okay. similar sound. A little bit more aloof, um, mm -hmm. but still very dark, uh, but also tongue-in-cheek. Um, okay. They were actually huh. kind of like, uh, they, they, they came from the same, I think, the same area as U2 at about the same time. Um, okay. so they were kind of considered like brother and sister bands uh, early on. Uh, gotcha. The Virgin Prunes were super dark, had that like cure pornography, chameleons mm -hmm. sort of vibe to it. Okay, it I'll keep an eye out for that one. Yeah, but uh, yeah, chameleons, they had three albums in their original run. The other two were also good, but they don't quite get back to this level of brilliance on the other two albums. They They have moments on both of those albums. There are some tracks here and there that are amazing but you know song for song the quality is not quite the same but they're all a good listen um they also had an ep that was very very good and they they're a band that kind of came back here and there they did some reunions i know they did a live album at one point that was also good so yeah, anything with the chameleon's name on it is again if if it's you know a few bucks at the cd store it's a good blind buy if you want to check it out but as eric alluded to their stuff has never been easy to come by unlike the mission you don't see it often, and when you do, it sometimes is a little pricier. Even when, when I got this uh, 20, 22, 25 years ago, uh, I had to trade some new wave of British heavy metal vinyl to get this CD. Nobody had it. I couldn't find it to order anywhere, and I, I finally found somebody that was willing to take Satan vinyl <laughs> in exchange for Chameleon CDs. It's so, been reissued, but even those are spendy. Those got sucked up too? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it kind of speaks to the quality of the band. It's one of those bands that people that like them, they really like this band. Yeah. They, they really they like it, these they don't want to let it go. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they don't let the, they don't take these and dump them, you know, at the local CD store to get, you know, money for, you know, gas and cigarettes for the weekend or anything. <laughs> they, they hold on to these and they hold on to them tight. But yeah. So if you want, you know, really dark post punk, uh, brilliant, jangly Brit pop album, you, I can't find a better one here than this one. Sweet. Well, I'm going to keep on going, and you might as well call me Captain Obvious with this one, because... Uh, oh, Captain, my Captain. Rush, <laughs> moving Pictures. I think Jeff will be stoked about that one. This album, I've got all the early Rush stuff. i got albums after this, and there's some great albums in their catalog, but this has and always will be my favorite Rush album, especially on vinyl. On vinyl, this thing sounds so fucking great. Recorded analog. On analog, it just sounds the way it's supposed to sound. The songs are so rich. And if you're a metalhead and don't like Rush, man, I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, Getty's vocals might be a little strange, but so is King Diamond. So is, you know, very proggy, rock, hard rock. I don't know what you want to call this. These guys were kind of groundbreaking as far as their technicality, their songwriting. Um, Neil Peart's lyrical concepts were super highbrow and touching at times and this amazing album by an amazing band that it's sad to be gone but i'm not a big fan of their later efforts but uh if you're a metalhead and haven't heard rush definitely start at moving pictures it is just a great warm sounding it's like this is like comfort food to me this is just one of those albums you put on you know the words to the whole thing and it just, it feels, everything about this thing feels right. 
Yeah, it's definitely their watershed moment. Yeah, I, I, I'll admit I am not a huge Rush fan, and I, I openly admit it's just a fa personal failing as a human being on my part. So. No, I mean I get it, I get it, but <laughs> but uh, but uh, even even I can I can really appreciate that album. That yeah, it's just everything about the way it's put together. It's very very it's it's classic. Crest of Steel guy. All right, Eric, let me get you over here. Uh, all right, uh, so I guess we'll go with um, blah. Oh, nice noise unit grinding into emptiness. I had that on tape, actually. You sent it to me, actually. So I did. Yeah, I have it on tape <laughs> and vinyl. <laughs> right on. Um, <coughs> this consists of Bill Lieb from Frontline Assembly, as well as Mark Verhagen from The Clinic. Um, this is the first noise unit record, if I'm not mistaken, back when they still had vocals, they became basically an entirely instrumental industrial band, more in line with some of the more aggressive frontline assembly, uh, type tunes. Um, but if you're familiar with the clinic, uh, which was kind of like an experimental noise industrial project in the early eighties, maybe even dating from to the late seventies. Um, it has more in common with that than it does with Frontline Assembly or any of that like early network uh, records uh, sound. Um, it still has you know quite a bit in common with that. Uh, you'll hear nods to Cyber Active and kind of by vicinity, um, uh, freaking Einstein Neubauten, um, as well as. Uh, echoes of some skinny puppy stuff on here. Um, I'm pretty sure all those guys were probably at some point in the studio with these guys putting these tracks down anyway. Um, it is, I would hesitate to call it an industrial record. Um, it starts off that way on the A side. Um, the only real traditional track is the first track, Collapsed. It's very much in line with like something you would hear on the initial command by Frontline. Um, but everything else following that is just kind of like an ambient, trippy mood piece. Um, and it's great. It's very cohesive as an album. Um, it doesn't sound like bits and pieces just thrown together uh, as like an audio collage. Um, the B-side's probably a little bit stronger in terms of... Um, longevity i suppose um more some more traditional song structures on here but it's super it's it's what the title says uh grinding into emptiness it's just dirty dirgy industrial ambience it's it's a fucking great record um it's hard to find these days i know that it's been reissued at least once uh in the 2000s uh, but i think even that's become difficult to acquire um this is a fucking great record though if you are at all interested in like that early vancouver industrial sound this is a good place to start as as any really um short of you know skinny puppy or frontline right on but might as well keep going with the theme you've got rolling here <laughs> skinny puppy one of my favorite bands um Cleanse, Fold, and Manipulate was the first one I heard. And this album, to me, when I first heard it, sounded like a nightmare put to music. But didn't fall off the rails to the point where it wasn't music anymore. It wasn't really noise. It's just really artistically layered sounds. Very nightmarish. Um, if you're a metalhead, this is a good place to start. So is Too Dark Park. This is a lot more noisy, a lot more chaotic. But still, the songs are there. Um, I could have picked, you know, Frontline Assembly. I picked that up too, and I really like like Caustic Grip and Tactical Neural Implant and a lot of Frontline Assembly stuff. But to me, the Skinny Puppy is the industrial band that I think a lot of other industrial bands wish they were in a lot of ways. You know, they had the their art students, so I mean, their art their live shows were a spectacle that somehow perfectly matched the music they were playing, which. To me is really advanced it's an advanced way of approaching your art and um i like 
pretty much all their albums, even the later ones after Dwayne died, um, they're a lot dancier. But that's still the layering is really cool, and I've just always liked. Of course, Ogre's voice is unique and strong and interesting, and I love the way he filters it through all the effects and the pitch shifters on the early stuff. It's a lot more so good, dude. Yeah, it's a lot more horror I mean, inspired, whereas now it's just more you know simple effects. But um, Skinny Puppy's great. You really can't go wrong with the first half of their career. You know. Probably after the process is when things started getting a little strange. You know, they got a little bit more, like I said, a little bit more EDM maybe influenced. But they're one of my favorite bands. And I, if you're a metalhead and listen to it and can't at least appreciate the layering and the artistry of it, you just don't like electronic music, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's... Oh, yeah. I think that's everything up to... Up and including the process, but yep. yeah, just fucking killer. It's just absolutely killer stuff. Oh, it's a band I've never checked out. I've, I've known the name for decades and I've just never got around to checking them out. I mean, their early stuff is maybe a li little less layered, but uh, Mind the Perpetual Intercourse, um, Bites and Remission are both amazing. Really good. Got I like it all. Like, what's that? I like it all. I, I, do to, I don't think I could pick a favorite, honestly. If I did, it would probably be probably be rabies because it's probably the one I reach for the most, but it's not necessarily the one that I like the most. I just am mo most familiar with the tracks on that one. That that album, like War, the song Warlock, I think is a genius fucking song. And so good. It is so that song is so much feeling in it, and the, the layering is great. But Elaine Jorgensen was hanging out with them and getting yep. them all addicted to heroin and you mean he was doing heroin with them yeah pretty much <laughs> but he was in the studio too and you, you hear a lot more guitar samples in it like songs like tin omen um stuff like that it's just looking at it now i reach for it the least because the elaine jorgensen influence i don't dislike elaine i, I like ministry i like you know good chunks of ministry's catalog but i didn't really necessarily want him involved with skinny puppy <laughs> I, I, I get that. I get that. Hmm. Was it right. Alex? I thought it was my turn after you, Marty. <clears throat> You're right. I'm sorry. I'm drinking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what are, are, you, are you drinking White Claw? Um, well, we had a big uh, to-do last week, and I ended up with a lot more beer. So I got White Claw and Fizzy and Truly and beer. Have, all sorts have, of you, have, you, found, have you found the White Claw Ultra? In I have not. The 8% uh, White Claws? Holy fuck. <laughs> That's right. That'll work. <laughs> yeah. It's like spiking your water with vodka. It's so gross. <laughs> yep. Okay. Nasty. Okay, it's my turn. Grotus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. With uh, slow motion apocalypse. This was, uh, this was a weird one. I bought this initially back in the day because it was put out by Alternative Tentacles. And I was like... Alternative Tentacles is a safe bet to, to buy just about anything on. Um, I had no idea what Grotus was going to sound like, and they don't sound like what you would imagine an Alternative Tentacles band to sound like. It's it's music that is so hard to describe, it's almost without a genre. Um, if I had to compare it to other bands, I would say maybe like Secret Chiefs 3 with uh, vocals or um, elements of Mr. Bungle, but there's also like very industrial elements, but there's also very like garage rock sort of influences in here as well. Um, it's it's just a really unique, really great album, but it's also super heavy. Um, the vocals are really surly, um, which I feel like a lot of bands of this ilk kind of miss the mark on. Um, this album though is just fucking killer. Uh, Fucking up, up rose the mountain, and good evening are like the first two tracks, and they're perfect, perfect lead in to the rest of this album. Um, yeah, kind of like an industrial Mr. Bungle, Secret mm -hmm. Chiefs Three, a uh, little bit less like goofy or like playful, a um, little bit more serious in terms of execution. This album's uh, it's killer. And I haven't heard of in a long time. It's been a and while. the cover art is also killer. Very cool. Mm -hmm. 
Alan. All right. Um, maybe this one kind of sticks in that industrial corner. Maybe not. I've never really known what to call this album. Um, it's a violent new breed <laughs> by a band called Shotgun Messiah. Tim Scold. Yeah, which has a they, the band has a weird backstory because they were a glam band and they weren't a particularly good glam band either. They're Swedish. Combat they put, put out, out a couple their of, first album, didn't they? Really? Yeah, I'm pretty uh, sure their first record was partially released by Combat. I don't know. But, like uh, a relatively Combat. Yeah, the the first one was self titled. I had it back in the day and. It, it very much was, you know, cashing in on the glam sleaze LA sound, even though the band was Swedish. I, you know, there were a couple of songs that could pass for MTV minor hits at that time, but um, it, they were definitely nothing special in terms of the hairspray crowd. And so, you know, they did the first album. I guess it got a modicum of attention enough that they did a second one. Uh, the second one came out right around the time that grunge was starting to break very big, so it got zero attention. And I pretty much figured, you know, that was it. You know, okay, they, they you know, this band, this band, much like this entire genre, is now toast. And then two years went by, and in you know, like spring of '93, they got uh, they used to send out some companies would used to send out these little sampler cassettes to record stores, indie stores in particular, and just be like, "What's new this month?" and he would have like, you know, one song each from, you know, different albums that were about to come out just as a way to, they were meant to be like freebie giveaways uh, just to try to get people to check stuff out before the, you know, internet really existed. And uh, I would, the dude at the local record store would always give me a copy of the tape when it came in each month. Cause it would have, you know, a couple of heavy songs, a couple of, you know, alt songs, a couple of industrial songs. It was meant to be non mainstream music. And, I forget what the name of it was. It had concrete in the name. Like concrete music blitz or something like that. It had named concrete in the tapes. But anyway, one of them had a song by Shotgun Messiah. And when I heard him, just like, I don't think this is even the same band. This this must be some other band with the same name, because it sounds nothing like the you know that glam album I had years ago. But when I checked into it, yeah, that band had you know they had stripped down to basically two guys and reinvented themselves as, again, I've never had a good way to describe it. I'm guessing they were very much playing off the success of things like Ministry and Nine Inch Nails around that time frame. Because uh, it's going for that more industrial sound, but it is very aggressive in more of a rock sense. You know, My one hang-up with you know, the popular industrial stuff coming out around that time was it sounded kind of heavy and kind of interesting, but it was never quite forceful enough to get my attention. And this one, damn, th this is just angry, fast, loud music. Um, yeah. This is very much where you you were meant to like you know just you know jack yourself up on speed and drive 150 miles an hour down the interstate at night with no headlights until you crash into the biggest thing possible. Uh, it's just, it's really, really good. Uh, if I ever have to die, just like in a fiery plane crash going a thousand miles per hour, I want the song I'm a Gun playing in the background. Because I will just go out, fuck yeah! Every time you play that. <laughs> it's really weird. You can even tell, what's even weird is you can tell some of these songs were probably written when they were still in hairspray mode. But they've reworked them, you know, into these, you know, again, more heavy, mechanical, angry sounding songs. And they work quite well in that vein. Uh, and this was one of those albums, yeah, for years, you know, I heard that song, thought it was really cool, got the album, never heard anything else about them for ages. But then I would start to mention them in this kind of conversation with other people, like on the old uh, Metal Maniacs forum back in the day. And there'd always be a couple other people just like, oh my God, I love that fucking album so much, nobody's ever mentioned it. So it's one that definitely seems to appeal to headbangers if they happen to have come across it. It's just that most people have never come across it. And if they did, they associated it maybe with the hairspray and would rightfully run away because those first two albums left a lot to be desired. Yeah. So yeah, violent more, new more in common with like sleaze bees than KMFDM. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very they were yeah, like 
a bad you know euro import version of faster pussycat or something so would that band sit kind of on the same shelf with like a band like screw no well i don't know the, the lineage of of shock and messiah was that it was, it was tim scold's project and he went from shock and messiah to scold which i probably would put on the same shelf as like screw or any of those van richter industrial bands yeah. like justify or seal wolf uh, and then he joined KMFDM for uh, the Angst and the Nihil albums, I believe. He uh, was a part of KMFDM. Oh, huh. okay. What little I know of KMFDM, that that fits. Yep. He was. I think he was the primary writer for uh, the Drug Against War track on Angst. I could be wrong about that. That's my favorite KMFDM album, actually. That's <laughs> my favorite. It's the best one. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's a random album, and it's very much the kind of thing you can find you know for four bucks, you know, in a used CD stack somewhere. Uh, it's a rager. It, it, it is very. It will get the blood pumping. Yeah. Wow. You, you I don't even mind eleven. They're glam shit. Like honestly, as far as like glam bands are concerned, mm -hmm. Shock and Messiah is like on a pretty tall level, in my opinion. But that's cool. Yeah. They, I, they, were, they had one or two songs on the first album that were I liked. I think it was the first two tracks, but after that, I just. It, they didn't click for me uh, relative to others, but that's cool if you're into them. Well, right. I said I was into them. I just said, as far as glam goes. <laughs> yeah, we were on a relative scale. No, you <laughs> said you were into them. You said you loved them. On a glam rock scale, <laughs> they don't make me want to vomit. <laughs> All right. I don't know if this is going to, people are going to like sign off after I show this or not, but I like Susie and the Banshees quite a bit. And these are my two favorite albums by her The Hyena and Tinderbox. Okay. Um, oh, that's cool. Hyena has got Robert Smith from The Cure on guitar. And maybe their most... I don't know. This, this seems like a very involved album to me. But this one, Tinderbox, is probably one of her most popular releases. And there's just something about the recording of this. It's very mystical sounding. It's got a very mystical atmosphere to it. The songs are really great. You could tell it's kind of trying to stretch towards a little more commercial audience, maybe, but this it's just produced so well. I guess Susie started off as a post punk baby, essentially, uh, with the scream, and her stuff got a little bit more alternative nation, 120 minutes formed as she went along. But I, I got a lot of her stuff, and these two are definite stands out stand out for me. I don't know if it would appeal appeal to a lot of metalheads, but I grew up with friends that were very much into this stuff, and I think it's great, great stuff. It's a definite good dark change of pace when you don't want to hear a bunch of distortion. Yeah. How how do Susie and the Banshee albums compare to one another? I've only heard I've heard a little here and a little there, and I don't know if it was kind of a constant, you know, if they were pretty similar or did they change styles a lot over time? You know, I don't know if you agree, Eric, but it, to me, there was a, there's a definite consistency, a, a writing thread throughout all their stuff. I mean, after Tinderbox, I think was the album superstition. That was even a bit more commercial. Um, and then to, it went to the, what the hell is the name of the one? The Rapture had peekaboo on it. I didn't care for that album too much. That, I think that yeah, I had that one. I think it was, yeah, Peep Show or oh, Peep Show. That's what it was. Yes. Yeah, I had that one usually, and it was pretty good for what yeah. it was well, for that style. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just dark, good, um, alternative gothy music. I, do you have anything to add to that, Eric? I mean, she kind of followed the trajectory of like the Cure. She started off pretty like in that post punk goth niche, yeah. but then became more pop centric as the albums went on. Okay. Um, to the point where the latter stuff would not fit on a goth shelf whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of like what happened with the cure after mm -hmm. disintegration or wish um, yeah, yeah. just became a full on pop band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which isn't not to say that that's a bad thing. Like they both did it very well. Like and they both did it and still sounded like themselves. You know, they right, didn't, exactly. they didn't, they didn't adopt a whole nother different style. It, it, it was a gradual progression for both bands. And you're right. They, they did follow along a very parallel trajectory for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me get this straight here. There we go. All right. So some of you people watching may have heard of some band called Amoebix back from, you know, back in the day. Oh, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> I'm not talking about Amoebics. When Amoebics broke up, uh, they kind of splintered. Uh, I think a lot of why they broke up was internal strife and turmoil uh, between members as far as wanting creative output and creative control. Um, so Rob and one or two others went on to form a band called Zygote, um, which was kind of Amoebics-ish, but way more in the Joy Division range. Um, and then a couple of their other members kind of held off from being involved in music for a while, but they ended up starting a band called Cross Stitched Eyes. Hmm. And this was released on Alternative Tentacles in 2012. It's not their first record. Uh, their first record is also excellent. I kind of prefer this one, though. And um, you're going to get uh, music that sounds in that vein of um, Amoebics-ish kind of British uh, post- like really dark post-punk, kind of like UK Decay, um, or some of the slower, darker Zounds material. Um, it's uh, got pop elements to it. It has neo-folk elements to it, but it never really loses track of its roots in, um, in, in I don't want to say crust, because even if you listen to Amoebics and like listen real, real hard, Amoebics was basically blending what they were hearing from Venom and Joy Division and Bauhaus at the sure. same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you get a bit more of that on this. Uh, for my money, it's a lot more solid of a project than the Zygote stuff was. There wasn't very much Zygote material released. I think they did like an EP and then a full length that Profane Existence released. Pretty sure that just got reissued not too long ago. And it's good, but it basically sounds like Amoebix Part 2. Um, this has a lot more of its own identity um it's also a little bit warmer um than i would describe that other stuff sounding uh it's a lot more the the like the amoebics rob type shit is a lot more cold and like mechanical and nihilistic uh than what you get on this um this is a great album they released a new one within the last couple of years i think um so they got three or four albums to their name they're all good um and it's just kind of a different take on the creative forces involved in one of the most um, influential and now controversial bands of all time. Um, not crusty. Uh, so I stuck with my goal of not including any crust because crust is super metal adjacent and sure. would have been a fucking cop out, in my opinion. Um, this, however, uh, you I mean, a lot of crusties are probably going to have no idea what you're talking about if you mention cross-stitched eyes. Um, kind of a weird addition to the Alternative Tentacles roster, uh, but really fucking good. Um, it's a little all over the place, but it's also uh, very cohesive um, and a, a, a cool project. Right on. Never even heard of them. New one to me. And I'm up. No, me up. Yeah. Well, since you mentioned it, I couldn't get through this without mentioning Joy Division, another one of my probably top 10 non metal favorite bands. And I got all their stuff, even the pre Joy Division, post punk stuff, uh, Warsaw. But Joy Division are one of those bands, um, you can tell the misery that's. In Ian Curtis in this music. I mean, uh, granted, he didn't write the music, but the words and his voice, he perfectly matched what was being played below him. And Closer is Closer is a damn depressing record. Um, he died. Is that your favorite? I really can't pick a favorite. Um, yeah, I really can't pick a favorite. They're <laughs> they're it's just hard to pick a favorite it's they're all good for they're all very similar but this is obviously on an obvious downturn in the guy's <laughs> life <laughs> oh yeah it, it just bleeds through this music and the you can just hear the woe in his vocals but um i you really can't call this gothic music you can't really call this alternative music it just kind of had its own thing going it had their own lane and even after he died the first new order album called movement Great that album is just as fucking great as the Joy Division stuff. Obviously, Ian had died, and I think that impacted the band quite a bit because that 
sorrow continued on in that music as well before they turned out to be you know a little more poppy mm -hmm. as they went along. Honestly, I love that the the early New Order stuff. I think is as good as the Joy Division. It's stuff. very it is very similar. It's very similar in style and execution as well. But um, you got Peter Hook with his great bass lines. You can tell he's using Rickenbacker bass on this stuff. It just has that metal metally jangle to it, and this shit's amazing. If you are wanting to try something different, um, Joy Division definitely. If you know, you can if you appeal to the darker side of metal, I think Joy Division would uh, feel very suitable. Yeah. Joy Division is one of those bands, I'll admit, has never clicked with me. When I read the lyrics and stuff, yes, it seems like it's right up my alley. But there's something when I hear the music that it just doesn't quite connect. And I, I can't really put my finger on it. It's well, vocals, a band I, I think, think are an acquired taste. I think for a lot of people, you know, I, I I don't hold this against the band over, but yes, like, you know, the vocal approach, like on, of course, love will tear us apart with the video has always just sounded all very weird and quote unquote wrong to me. Um, right. But I mean, I'm not holding that one song against, you know, the band at all. I've heard all their albums at least once. And it's not that I don't like it. They're not bad, but I can't quite ever. I never have that. I've yet to have that big moment where it's like, Oh yeah, now I get them. So it'll come one day, I'm sure. What's always kind of like I've thought was funny is that, you know, like Unknown Pleasures is considered a post-punk record, but it came out in 1979 when punk rock was still, you know, like the first wave was still happening yeah. in 79. Um, well, Warsaw was, was started after the members of Joy Division Warsaw saw right. Six Pistols show. Yeah. Yep. They all Warsaw is great too. That material is awesome, and it, to me, it's like the early Joy Division, and I love it all. And that Warsaw material is like if UK seventy seven punks were listening to a lot of Pink Floyd relics, and that's kind of what you get with like that early Joy Division shit. Yeah, um, yeah, that's good. That's a good comparison for sure. And I just see that Rick mentioned Sid Barrett, so yeah, it's kind of yeah. <clears throat> Similar vibes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember right, Peter Hook was among the folks. There was one infamous Sex Pistol show. I think it was in Birmingham yep. the summer before they broke big, and it, it, it's a uh, it, it's there, there's an entire mythology about who was and wasn't at that show. But well, the most number of the people of, that were there started punk bands. The the number of people after. that yeah went on to other projects, you know, and, and very big projects, whether it was writing, running record labels, uh, bands like Warsaw and Joy Division is just ridiculous. It's can, one of the bigger music publications had it listed as, you know, possibly the most important rock show of the 20th century. Not because it's the show that broke the Sex Pistols big, it's not. But just because of yeah the the influence it had on those people to go out well, and certainly on the UK scene build that scene certainly the UK scene for sure mm -hmm. yep uh, who's next I think I fucked up and got us out of order okay we we switched around at one point but that's all cool right. we're all good we'll <laughs> it's all good when uh, to go since we're talking uh yeah sort of you know depressive gothy stuff um, this one's going to seem obvious but some folks may have missed it uh, let's circle back to the cure for a minute and give this one its due because damn this is a spooky dark album it's a great record <laughs> it is an incredible record and again it may seem obvious however somebody who runs a YouTube channel I'm not going to name names because I don't want to incriminate let's just call it the D path no 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 let's call it the dark P. <laughs> okay. recently admitted to not really knowing much about this band or having checked them out. So if, if that person uh, will uh, just call him at um, <laughs> somehow missed them, other folks have too. And y'all need to circle back and check out some of this stuff. Uh, everything about this album, the cover image has always kind of struck me as very spooky. The production on this album is very cold and very jarring. The, the snare sound, every time it hits, it just like, it's like poking that corner of your brain that makes you flinch a little bit. Yep. Uh, it, it's suicide music, and the, it's no other way to describe it. So dark, but really very, very good. And as y'all were uh, mentioning before, you know, the band gradually moved away from that. And you get to stuff like this, and it's just as good, even oh, though yeah. it's a very different style. It's you know, popular. It's popular, yes. It's more much more commercially digestible, but it's still, it's beautiful music. And uh, 
it's yeah one of those bands that a lot of metalheads would be like i'm not into goth i don't like you know pop you know pretty music but they'll own at least these two cure albums if not several more that came out in between them uh, and rightfully so they, they had so a good carnage run. visors those are total suicide albums yeah um yeah, Six, sixteen shoot. seconds is also really good too. Sixteen seconds yeah, is good. Seventeen, uh, 17 seconds. Seventeen, 17 seconds. seconds. The, the, the head on the fucking amazing. The head on the is it the head on the wall? Head on the door. Head on the door. Head on the door. That one is very. That one gets overlooked. Some I think. I had a a friend I used to do role playing games with was just a huge Cure fanatic. So he you just kept lending me one CD after another until I worked through. You know, he had all these live bootlegs and concert shows and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I, I've heard a ton of Cure stuff, and a lot of it is extremely good. So if by chance you're one of those people that uh, somehow just took a pass on this band, thinking that it was all Friday, I'm in love and whatnot, no, no, cir circle back and at least check out this pair. If you listen to this pair and you're still not interested, fair enough. This album, I think, just you know, as a cultural touchstone, you oh, ought yeah. to know what it sounds like. Talk about it. It's a very depressing album, too. Very fucking depressing. It well, parts of it are. There there are some very sad songs on here, but there are some there's some beautiful music on here as well. Oh, yeah. Th this one, yeah, you know, this one just makes you want to curl up in the fetal position and wait for life to end. The, yeah. There's nothing this is not a pretty album. No. It's a great album, but it is not a pretty album. I was going to yeah. show some cure, but I figured one of you two guys would do the deed for me. And I didn't want to. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to Mr. Bauer. I mentioned these guys a little bit earlier. Secret Chiefs 3 with their hmm. first record. First Grand Constitution and Bylaws. Um, this fucking project is awesome. Um, it consists of Trevor Dunn and Trey Spruance is basically Mr. Bungle without vocals. Um, got the the guys looking like they're ready for some sort of interstellar Middle Eastern battle there. <laughs> um, it's just an awesome record. It's where Mr. Bungle is a little bit more carnivalish. This is a bit more Middle Eastern in tone. Um, so you hear a lot of traditional Middle Eastern instrumentation on here. Um, it's very, uh, I don't know, I would call it like desert music almost. Um, it's good music for psychedelics as well as good music for um, THC uh, indulgences. Um, similar to a local band, Master Musicians of Bukaki. Uh, whose name I will never get tired of saying <laughs> in any context. Um, yeah, Secret Chiefs 3, they've got more material than this. This is, like I said, their first album, probably my favorite. Um, just really great instrumental, um, you know, I would say rock, but there's moments of heavy, there's moments of absolute quiet and, uh, and chill. Um, it kind of just runs the gamut of everything. Um, but it's again super cohesive. Um, the absence of vocals doesn't make it any less compelling, um, even though you know it is full length uh, album. Um, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, just a fucking awesome album, and one that I feel like if you're into a little bit more weird, experimental avant sort of rock, um, i.e. Mr. Bungle, like the first two Mr. Bungles, even the first three, like Disco Volante or California, especially, um, you'll like it. I mean, it's you know, like I said, it's basically the same band minus minus Mike Patton. Right on. Interesting. Don't know that one. Nope. All right. I don't know why I've been waiting to show this, but another one I of my favorite it. bands. I knew it. Yep. You knew it, yep. of course. I mean, I saw the thumbnail. How could you not? Yep. <laughs> Probably my favorite Fields album, but although I like them all, they're all great. Um, this one to me, I picked this one because, you know, songs like Phobia and Last Exit for the Lost probably would appeal to a metalhead. Phobia in particular, it's a very upbeat track, very dark. Carl McCoy's um, desperate, dark, almost evil sounding vocal snarl is 
great, often, often uh, imitated, never really fully replicated. Um, they started off as kind of a spaghetti Western goth band, and they kind of evolved. Like after this album, Elysium is very much a cut your wrists and watch yourself die kind of album. <laughs> yep, there it is. Absolutely. And then they, then Carl uh, splintered off and did um, the Nephilim, which was his project, very metal. It was very much in the uh, that whole era where bands like Screw and other bands were popping up, where it's like industrialized metal. Although he took more of a, a metalized Fields of the Nephilim approach on that album, but it's still very good. And then they got back again with uh, Fallen and Morning Star, which again have a lot of heavy guitars in it. Could be very much a goth metal type of uh, hybrid, but um. First two albums are absolute classics. The third one is a, a very different style shift. Like I said, more um, shoegazy, I guess, and a lot more depressive. But these guys sound like no one else at the time, in, in, as far as I've heard, and very influential. They had the look. They had the sound. Powder on your uh, duster and uh, a tons would of you, fog machines live. <laughs> Marty, would you say they've got the look? They got the look of love. Hell they yes. Got the look. So I beat Alan to Fields of the and That makes me somewhat happy. <laughs> I, I, I had it. I, there was no way I was mentioning that one until you did. <laughs> right on. And I got to say, that was one of the more th uh, fun thumbnails I've gotten to splice together. Once oh, I found killer. that picture, I knew, I knew exactly what to do with that picture once I found it. Nailed it. <laughs> You're up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is an obscure one. And I'm pretty sure it's the only album the band ever made, but I've always liked it. And it's it's a weird little niche all its own. Uh, it's a album by a band called War Babies. Oh, oh man. <laughs> I thought, Eric, you might know this one based on geography, if nothing else. Uh, but yeah, this one, uh, oh. it has a metal connection. Uh, Brad Sinzel <laughs> was the vocalist back in the TKO Um which was, you know, a decent enough metal band in the 80s. They did some cool stuff here and there, but you know, never quite broke big. And so then he uh, had broken up that project, put together this one. And this had the unfortunate timing to come out in 92 out of, you know, the Pacific Northwest. So it immediately... That's a death blow right there. Yep. It immediately got lumped in, you know, to the grunge movement. But it's not a grunge record whatsoever. It's just kind of a good rock album it doesn't really need any other descriptor uh good so sound to it you know he, he always had a strong voice uh some songs lean a little you know have more of a bluesy rock song sound to him a lot of them were very catchy they had a very minor mtv video hit with uh i believe it was the song hang me up the opener uh, yep. which is why i first heard him was like that's actually a pretty damn good song <laughs> you know, back on the album and this was one of those that in high school I could very much play for around kids who were not headbangers, but they still wanted to hear, you know, heavier stuff, you know, cause this was yeah, a little, you didn't hear this of course on the radio or anything, but yeah, it was a really popular one. We would all go sit outside, you know, for lunch, you know, and I'd, I'd have, you know, like, you know, the, you know, cheerleader girls were like, you know, the big permed hair come up like, Alan, do you have your war babies uh, tape today? But yeah, you know, we'd throw it in the ghetto blaster somebody have, and everybody would enjoy it. So when I was thinking about it, I was like, yeah, that's one of those albums that's a little bit, it's not a metal album, not whatsoever, but it's got a little, you know, it's a little heavy, and it definitely appeals to a wide swath of people, because I'd play it for other, you know, headbanging kids, and be like, yeah, let me borrow that and take it home tonight and run off a copy of it, because that's actually pretty cool. So um, yeah, I think it's the only thing they did. They came and went pretty fast, but it's just a, it's a cool little relic from the age that got completely mislabeled and never really had a chance because of that. Got anything to say about that, Eric? <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. It was told a long time ago, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're up. That was, that was one of those bands of that era uh, that I think blew up only because they were from Seattle. Oh, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, it's funny because I actually just tried listening to that record about a week ago. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was, I mean, 
That's cool. If it's not your thing, it's not it's, your thing. It's it's one of those records that it's it's like I recognize that it's a little bit important because they were doing something different in a region where everybody was trying to suddenly mimic something that was already happening. Um, mm -hmm. But it uh, it misses its mark for me. We'll just we'll just say that. That's cool. And I I wouldn't doubt that you're correct. They probably were scooped up as labels were rushing to sign anything in that region and just yeah. without even barely listening to it. I, they may not, without that happening. Yeah. They may not have uh, actually gotten that album released and certainly not on a bigger label. Was that you, could you lump drum truck into that uh, war babies classification? But no, I just lump drum truck as, as being awful. That was terrible. Uh, yeah. Drum truck's so. the only, the only high points for drum truck are that, I think Jack and Dino produced the first record, and Tommy Accused was on the first record, mm -hmm. if, yep, I'm, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Um, I I don't like Grunt Truck. Yep. That is an album that has aged very badly. Yep. This was a Sony Columbia. Sony era. Columbia. Wow, really? Wow. Yep. <laughs> you can tell the big labels are like, Seattle, Seattle. You, you're from Seattle. Them. Here, here, have some money. Make us a record. They had one or two MTV hits, um, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. They had like one video that was like on a lot. H Hang me um, up got a decent amount of video play on like Headbangers Ball because they didn't know where else to put it. It, it, it was yeah. never like on their you know daily top ten video countdown or anything. They, but they struck me as like a bunch of hair metal dudes that heard the cult all of a sudden and decided that they wanted to do something similar, but badly. Yeah. And that's, uh, I can see the comparison, something like the cult. And again, yeah, they, you know, what Brad definitely, you know, had that TKO wasn't really a hair metal band, but they weren't like, uh, they, 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 they kind of know they kind of fell into what that Lizzie Borden style where they kind of had a little bit of that look, but where it had a little more bite to them than, you know, any of your real, like, you know, LA Sunset Strip bands. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll say for its era, I'll take the War Babies over anything Galactic Cowboys, but yeah, uh, not really saying a lot. No, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Speaking that's just me, though. No, that's, that's cool. Me. Okay. Uh, so well, this is number 10, I think, for me. Uh, I've got a few, bunch of show. <laughs> I, have a few, I have a few honorable mentions, but um, I had to pull this. Zombie, uh, hmm. Steve Moore, electronic project. This was, uh, I believe this is their demo. Um, it's called the Zombie Anthology, but it's like earlier unreleased shit um, that Relapse kind of put together in a single LP. Um, yeah, so you've got their 2001 demo and then a couple tracks that they put out in 2008, or no, 2003, excuse me. Um, and if you're not familiar with Zombie, uh, it is uh, kind of the brainchild of a certain individual named Steve Moore, who has worked with a lot of electronic artists. Zombie is very reminiscent of um, John Carpenter, Alan Howarth soundtracks. Um, people would probably lump it in with like Fabio Fritzi or um, uh, that type of stuff, but I don't get much of a Fritzi vibe off of zombie and i never have the carpenter vibe for sure um it's just really really good forward thinking electronic music um similar to like uh some of those super good jean michael jar or uh tangerine dream type material um it's great shit um this is kind of where it starts for them so not a bad place to start in their discography. I think they just put out a new record this year. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I have been very bad about keeping track of new releases. Um, I got a bunch of zombie stuff. I have a bunch of Steve Moore stuff. He's done a lot of soundtracks. He did the soundtrack for the movie The Guest. Um, he did the soundtrack for this other movie called Cub. Um and they're, they're very similar vibe to what you get with Zombie. One of the cool things about Zombie, though, that I really appreciate about this project is that aside from the synths being utilized by Steve Moore, um, the musicianship is live. So it's 
you know, actual drums rather than a drum machine. Um, you'll hear actual bass, actual guitar on occasion. Um, but it's great shit. Yeah, zombie. Sweet. I'm, I'm up. And that's numero 10. All right. Numero G8. Another favorite of mine, Dead Can Dance. This is their debut album. Uh, when they were still kind of a bit post-punky, they evolved into more of a gothic-laced world music style of band. Um, a lot of their shit's amazing. Amazing. Amazing talent. Both vocals are great. Um, if you ever seen the, uh, the Gladiator soundtrack, or you ever seen the movie The Gladiator, a lot of that really ethereal... What's her uh, face? Yeah, I can't remember her damn name right now. She did a lot of soundtrack work for um, Ridley Scott in the 90s and yep. into the 2000s. So she did, yep. yeah, uh, Gladiator and uh, Black Hawk Down. Yep. But this shit is really great. Um, this is a little bit more guitar. This is more band-oriented, really. This is more, like I said, it's got a, a post-punk vibe. It's really kind of hard to explain. They don't really sound like anybody to me. Um, as they went on, they got a lot more ethereal and, um, it's just really great, great music. Metalhead should definitely jump on board with that. Lisa Gerard, Lisa Gerard. Oh my God. Then Brandon, Brendan was the other guy. can't remember his last name. Brendan Perry. Perry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Alan. No, All Eric. Right. No. no. Who's next? Yep. Alan. Well, I went before you did, but remember you switched it up. I got fucked mm. up. You jumped the good. line. Line cutter. <laughs> now I've got yeah, my number 10. Uh, this is another one that I, I've come across a lot of heavy metal fans who like it, and it always kind of surprised me, even though it's a great album and I like it too. Uh, Depeche Mode's Black Celebration. This was a band I passed on hard for a lot of years because I always associated it with uh, the only people I knew back in the day who liked Depeche Mode were girls that would sit around in the back of the class and giggle about, ooh, I wonder if the lead singer is really a vampire like he claims to be. It was just like, oh, please take your Anne Rice book and go somewhere else. Just, just shut up. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just like, there's no fucking way I'm listening to that. <laughs> Um, but it was a band, you know, every now and then, you know, somebody heavier would be like, oh yeah, you know, you're into Depeche, but I'm just like, fuck no. And they're like, why not? I'm just like, because Anne Rice. And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and eventually, uh, it was, uh, the guy who used to run the Lapland metal forum, which was a big online forum for a while, right around 2000, 2001. Yep. Um, uh, he, you know, we, in uh, doing a CD trade or tape trade, you know, he just he recorded um, the Devil Live album for him. He's like 101 or something. Yeah. And he's like, it was, again, it was one of those cases where, you know, I didn't ask for it. I didn't want it. You know, I opened up the thing. I was just like, oh, fuck. He sent it to me. He's going to make me <laughs> listen to it. He's just like, just shut up and listen to the damn thing one time. Uh, and if you hate it, fine. You can rant and rave all you want. And I, I was like, fair enough. I'll play it one time. Well, I ended up playing it a lot more than one time. I was like, well, shit, this stuff, you know, it's, it's I can see why some folks wouldn't like it, but uh, it is very catchy. You can really get stuck in your head for a long time. It's got, you know, they had a dark sense of humor uh, in their music, you know, that has an appeal. And they did several good albums. This is, you know, my personal favorite, but uh, you might say it's my personal Jesus. Uh, you know, they've done several really solid ones in this style, yeah. and if you like, you know, those, you know, uh, anything, you know, that's got you know, more of those, you know, sort of synth pop leanings to, you know, a little bit of EBM leanings, I, a lot of those bands owe a lot to Depeche Mode, and it, it doesn't seem like something that would appeal to metalheads, but it's it's definitely a band that uh, a subset of metalheads really do latch onto and sure. find uh, enjoyable. So, had to mention them. Uh, yep. It, again, you can go with uh, almost any of their early albums are going to you know be pretty solid. I, I would get this one if you could, but there are others that will be just fine too. Sweet. And, and no, and no, ladies, he's not really a vampire. So <laughs> shut up about it. That's that's code speak for heroin addict. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Oh, Eric. Shit. Oh, wait, me. Me? Oh, Eric. Me. Damn it. Get Eric. it together, man. I'm glad I'm not Is drinking it... the 8% hipster tears. I'd be in real trouble. They make an 8% truly also. It's truly ultra. Well, if one does it, they'll all do it. Ultra truly. Yep. <laughs> all right, let's see. Said so you got some honorable mentions and such, Eric. Well, yeah, I guess I do. Um, okay, we'll go with uh, the hard ons. Uh, love is about, or this is fuck. I pulled the wrong hard ons. This one works too. Dick Cheese. <laughs> I pulled the wrong hard on. <laughs> the first, the first hard ons album, Dick Cheese. Uh, hard ons were a pop punk band in the eighties from Australia. Um, kind of notoriously one of Henry Rollins' favorite bands from the eighties. Uh, oh. To the fact, to the point where he did a split with them, where they both cover uh, uh, fucking. Uh, Jesus Christ, uh, ACDC, um, Let There Be Rock, um, and it rules. And one of the things about the Hard-Ons is that they were a punk band, and they were a pop punk band specifically, um, but they weren't afraid to incorporate um, some metallic elements in their music. So you will hear a lot of shit that uh, almost borders on speed or thrash metal at times, but it's always super tongue-in-cheek, and it's always within keeping... Uh, within the tone of the song that they're playing. Um, it's really cleverly done. It's The writing's awesome for as simple as three-chord pop punk really is. Um, they do it just kind of superbly. And um, while I meant to pull their second album because it's my favorite of the of the first two Hard Ons records, they're almost interchangeable in, in how they sound. Um, yeah, Dick Cheese. Dick Cheese. <laughs> For the hard ons. Hey Eric, uh, I, I, hear, I heard they uh, they came on really strong, but got softer towards the end. Is that an yeah? That's true. That's true. But you know what? They're still around and making music and putting out records, and it's still great. It's a little bit more pop uh, leaning at this point, um, but it's it's awesome. Uh, and at this point, I think it's all three original members plus one or two other guys because you know they got older and. They need more people to support the band than just three youths uh, screaming on a beach. Yeah. <laughs> All it's right. Good. Get this right here. Um, you know, I'm a metalhead, and I love this band. This band, this album, these. Well, this is a collection of two albums and some uh, other tracks. But um, Minor Threat and Out of Step. You want to talk about piss and vinegar hardcore. The shit is super aggressive without having a ton of distortion in the guitars. It's just very much the energy of the music and what they're playing and Ian's vocals and um, lyrical approach was like a punch to the face. I mean, that's a cheesy thing to fucking say, but it's true. It's like, I listen to this stuff. This is great driving music to me. This stuff is just so hard driving. Um, if you're a metalhead and can't appreciate this, there's something wrong because this stuff is really solid. Full on hardcore. Coined the phrase straight edge. Didn't mean to, but he did. <laughs> With that one song. And um, yeah. You mean the song Straight Edge? Yeah, the song Straight Edge. And I'm going to show this one too while we're on the same topic. These might be these might be easy, uh, cheap pulls, but I fucking love this band too. And this EPLP by the Subhumans is great an shit. amazing collection of punk songs. Very very British sounding, and mm -hmm. even their comeback album sound. Their last couple comeback albums have sounded just as good as the early stuff. Um, they they splintered off after a while and did a band called Citizen Fish, which was. Heavily oh, reggae oh. inspired. <laughs> yeah. You like some reggae, Citizen Fish is your jam. That's your jam. And there's a little of that creeps into some of this stuff, but it's super, super minimal. But this is straight up, when I think of UK punk, this is it. This band is it. And yeah, I love the Exploited. I love GBH. I was going to pull some records by both of those bands, but their musical trajectory started to get more metal as they went, especially the Exploited. They became um, metal bands. I they mean, became metal bands. Uh, GBH did as well on a fridge too far. They and uh, metal uh, midnight madness and beyond, which I love that record too. But it was a fucking great album. 
Yep, this is straight up punk, and it is fucking great. Again, you want piss and vinegar music with a lot of energy and aggression and um, religious and not religious, political and social topics. Good stuff. Yep. Hey, Marty, were Subhumans one of the bands that were on the punk stage in Milwaukee in 99? Dude, if remember. they were, I kick myself in the balls for not seeing them. I did not know they were there. I, I, mean, I, can't, I can't remember. that. Can't no, really. There were two Subhumans. There was the one from the UK and there was one from Canada. So yeah. a lot of people confused the two. It may have been. They, um, it was, yeah, it was Milwaukee 99. Uh, on the second day, they had one stage that was set aside. There was a tour. There was a, a punk UK punk all stars kind of tour going through the US at the time, and so they you know basically had well, it, it had to be it. it had to be subhuman. If it was UK, it had to be the sub that subhumans. And yeah, I, well, why I don't the know fuck did I not see that? I was so I, I don't drunk. Know, I may be wrong. Subhumans may not have been one of the bands there. I know like uh, UK Subs was definitely one of them. They were yeah, I, I saw them for a minute. Yeah. Uh, there were several, you know, but again, those things you're in and out. But uh, I, I just remember I liked a lot of the bands that were on it that day, and I thought it was actually the best stage they had going uh, that day by, by a long stretch. But I can't remember if Subhumans was on that bill or they, they may not have been. I was trying to remember. I didn't know if you remembered. That would have been, I would have. If I'd known that happened, I didn't see it. I'd been pissed. <laughs> okay. They probably weren't there because you probably would have known. Yeah. Who is next? Alan? Alan. Sure. Uh, okay. I got a few left. But yeah, I want to talk about the, this one because it's another one that a lot of, it's not metal at all, but a lot of metal fans uh, really like this album and other albums by this band. I don't know much of their discography, but uh, Court of the Crimson King. It, it's a classic for, and with good reason. Uh, <coughs> every song that was on here is good. It, there's a heaviness to this, you know, especially on you know 21st century schizoid. Uh, other songs are you know much lighter, more ethereal, more soundtrack sounding, but uh, it's just a very you know good collection of songs. Excellent musicianship, really interesting. It's the kind of thing, especially you know heavy metal fans who are more you know, attuned to the proggier side of things are going to especially eat this up if they've never checked it out. But um, I don't know if I've ever really played this for anybody and had them not like it. Or at least you know, no one's ever been like, oh, God, that sounded horrible. <laughs> it, 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 it's an album that, yeah, it, it seems to have a very broad appeal. And uh, yeah, it's just one of those classics that has nothing to do with heavy metal, but at the same time, yeah, heavy metal fans... Uh, Really did King Crimson. My first exposure to King Crimson was uh, Lark's Tongue in Aspic. A lot of folks picked that as their favorite, yeah, I think. It's a great record. Yeah, really Red is another one that a lot of heavy metal fans often I don't, put right at the top of their list. I've never been able to get into Red. Like, I just, I've I'm tried thinking. and it just, maybe it's just too proggy for me, which is funny since. Mm -hmm. Lark's Tongue and Aspic is a really proggy record, but like it still has some of that, dare I say, like a Hawkwind vibe to it almost, mm. uh, which I don't really get out of Red. Um, yeah, Red. Or even necessarily the Court of the Crimson King, but I, you know, mm. there's a fair amount of C King Crimson out there that is fucking great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I try to listen to Red, I quickly, I figure out after, you know, maybe halfway through, I'm just like, this is probably good and I'm just not in the mood for this right now. So I circle back to it every now and then and just, I haven't been in the right mood for red to really shoot up and uh, connect with me. There's a lot of people in the comments saying that they think red was their heavy dark album. And I don't, I don't it's know. Man. Like it just, a lot of folks describe it that way. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm in your camp on that one, Eric. I don't, I never it's never hit that. me that way. Yeah. I never got that vibe. Got another one, Eric. I mean, I got I got a couple more. They're kind of goofy, like goof picks, but um, here, cool. the Warlock Pinchers with deadly kung fu action, <laughs> <laughs> and this is a compilation CD that combines the Warlock Pinchers deadly kung fu action with their pinch a loaf record, and they're um, from Oakland, California. I'm gonna guess, judging by the cover art. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're on Boner Records, so. Out of Berkeley, probably well, from that from that region. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are the Warlock Pinchers? 
uh, like basically imagine um, Dead Milkman through like an early Beastie Boys filter with like hints of like the the shitty type of thrash metal that no one wants to talk about from the late <laughs> '80s, early '90s, like skate nigs or like fucking mind funk or from yes. uh, the you know the bad the bad songs from Wrathchild, uh, yeah. <laughs> but all all tongue in cheek, like well knowing that 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 era of that type of thrash is awful. Um, it's silly. It's goofy. Um, like I said, just Dead Milkman meets the Beastie Boys is like a really apt description for, for this stuff. Um, but, you know, like there's a cover on here of uh, Back in Black, uh, which is amazing. Uh, Where the Hell is Crispin Glover is a great track. <laughs> um, Wayne the Dead Battery Guy, also killer. Uh, fucking... Ladies and gentlemen, master magician Doug Henning and his wife Wendy, let's kill them. Great song. <laughs> it definitely sound like kind of like Dead Milkman song title. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Curious George and the Antichrist. <laughs> uh, Ballad of the Brothers Chuck. They said something about you. Um, I think we're Tiffany. Probably one of the best track uh, album enders of all time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, this shit's just, it's, it's hilarious. It's, uh, and it's, it's not like one of those joke albums that gets old after like two tracks, like it's compelling enough to listen to from start to finish. Um, hmm. great shit. Also just one of my favorite album covers from its, from its era, uh, Warlock Pinchers. I mean, just awesome. Nice. All right. I'm going to lump these two together cause they're very similar. We've got uh, Megaptera, Curse of the Scarecrow, and Raison Yetre, Collective Archive. Oh, yeah. Cold meat. Cold meat. Yep, cold meat stuff. And this is a release, uh, re uh, relapse release. But both of these albums are very similar. There's, this is a two-disc set. Basically, I had a stint where I was kind of getting into dark ambient music, and this is very much that. But this shit is very haunting. Very nightmarish, especially this Megaptera. Um, a lot of screams in the background. It's kind of unsettling to listen to. Not really, you think it'd be relaxing and being dark ambient type stuff, but there's a definite horror vibe swirling around the background. It's, like I said, very unsettling. Um, one of those headphones releases you put on, and it kind of makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Both of them are in the same realm for sure, but um, which one you got there, Eric? Let me... It's uh, in slaughter natives. Oh yeah, yeah. Another yep. cold meat band. Uh, Great stuff. One of my favorites. But it definitely. Issue with the, but I was just saying, my issue with a lot of that cold meat shit was that a lot of that shit was super sketchy, um, especially yep. like the MZ four twelve type. Oh yeah. And like yep. That type of shit, but uh, yeah, some great stuff. That absolute supper uh, comp has oh, probably great comp. the best of anybody involved in that label. Um, yeah, Porto Equilibrio stuff like that. Yeah, <coughs> Alan. Mm, sure, got a couple. Can start winding up with. I've mentioned this album on at least one other stream, but it definitely fits here as well too. Uh, it's a uh, Valley of the Suns volume rock. Uh, this is stoner rock, which yeah, it's a little metal adjacent. I don't think anybody would really describe this as a metal band, but uh, th this is a banger. Everything on this one is uh, full throttle, killer, ripping guitar solos, really fast paces. Uh, they slow down for some songs, but those songs are really good. They have a really good sort of moody desert rock atmosphere. The vocalist is very good for this style. Uh, really, really fun album. Uh, even stoner rock is a genre I've, flirt with a little bit but it's never really quite been my thing uh, you know a little here a little there is fine uh this album stayed in my car for two years i got the cd put it in and it just never left the car it was the perfect thing for just you know hitting the interstate on the commute uh day after day so 
yeah, uh, th- this one I think would have a lot of appeal to Headbangers, and the band just hasn't got much recognition. They've done several albums. They've done at least one since this that's also pretty good. But uh, yeah, this one just fires on all cylinders. The first couple of albums have a different lineup, and they're okay, but uh, yeah, they the lineup they put together for this album really clicked, and the sound got very, very tight compared to those first albums. So yeah, if, if again, if you want something that's not metal, but it'll definitely make you drive way too fast and play your music way too loud. Valley of the sun. Uh, the, the picture kind of says it all. Would you say kind of like Nebula and um, Fu Manchu type? A little bit like Fu Manchu. Yeah. I, for me, it's a, it's like a little more rock, a little more, it's got a little more of the desert rock vibe, oh, to it, especially on the slower songs. Yeah. It's not as trippy as Caius. It's almost, you know, Take the some a little bit of the atmosphere of Caius, but put it all into like you know an ACDC song templates where it's just meant to be four four straight up rock songs, but it's got that fuzzy you know the fast songs it's still got that fuzzy you know stoner sound to it, and gets you know a little bit of that you know, the slower songs have a little bit of that you know shamanistic you know you know the earth you know will rise kind of thing going on. It's just really cool. It's really really cool. Sweet, Eric. Okay, I got one more. Which doesn't mean that you guys can't keep going. But I got one more as well. I got one, and that'll be a good place to call it, I think. Oh, Sig Sig Sputnik. Killer. Sig Sig Sputnik. uh, (laughs) Most well-known for featuring a very angry Tony James, X, uh, Generation X, and Sisters of Mercy, uh, basically making an album mocking the Sisters of Mercy and most of the other groups involved in that particular scene. Um it's really hard to categorize yeah it's very silly um i mean just uh, all, all you really need to know about sig sig sputnik is that you know that's the band right there <laughs> um and they sound like they look yep. so uh you know take that for for whatever you will um it's at times new wave it's at times goth it's at times punk rock it's always really cheeky and really sardonic and really um kind of like if you like dive into the lyrics like he was pretty pissed off about like how he was just kind of cast out of the projects that he was involved in before starting sig sig sputnik um they were kind of one hit wonders on the radio uh, with uh, Love Missile F111 uh, or Sex Bomb Boogie. Yep. Or Rocket Miss USA was probably like their big <laughs> hit. Um, if you could say that Sig Sig Sputnik had a big yeah. hit. Um, I'm pretty sure there was a video for that on MTV. Uh, but it's, it's cool shit and it's fun. Um, it's abrasive and metallic enough that I think Open-minded, <laughs> open-minded dudes into metal would maybe dig it or at least laugh at it. I, uh, I think it's fun. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a good time. It's a good time summer record, uh, <laughs> you know. And that's kind of what I'm reaching for more than anything really these days. But um, mm. it's a uh, it's a fun listen. I, I checked it out again today just to make sure that like it holds up. And yeah, still dig it. Cool. All right, my final uh, do- salvo here is uh, <coughs> a guy that certainly had a started off in metal. He was a bass player for Emperor Mortis, mm-hmm. Crypt of the Wizard. Uh-huh. Basically, I don't know if uh, he was one of the he was one of the first early dungeon synth purveyors, and again, I think. He kind of spawned an entire genre. He had a hand in spawning an entire genre. I got a lot of Mortis records up until he turned out to be kind of a, a rock band. But um, this stuff here, this Crypt of the Wizards, this really cool dungeon synth where a lot of his other stuff is a little more free form. You can tell it's kind of improvised. This to me sounds like there's actually a little bit more form songs. Um like I like all the stuff up through Stargate, but uh, this is probably my favorite of the bunch, just Crypt of the Wizard thing. Um, again, a purveyor. A lot of other Dungeons and Synth bands wish they were him. 
<laughs> and today he's back to doing dungeon synth again because it's popular. You know, more power to him. Might as well reclaim the throne if you're gonna. You, know, <laughs> you mean you don't love his his earache era? Uh, not a big fan. I haven't heard a lot of it, but what I heard, it just didn't really do much. Like smell of rain and the grudge and stuff like that. I just <laughs> never do, do, dove into too much, but. I, think I would agree with Aaron with yeah. that comment, though, for sure. He has, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who is Alan? You got one more? I got one last one, and it's kind of an obvious one, but uh, it definitely fits the topic of stuff that's not really metal, but metalheads will dig it. And it's not a band I know a ton about, so I've never dug through their discography, so maybe other folks will be inspired to do so, too. But... Uh, Monster Magnet has some heavy shit. I like uh, Monster Magnet. I like a lot of the early stuff. Yeah. So That's a great of, record. Th this is the only one I've really sat down and paid a lot of attention to. And, uh, you know, it, it, they can be very goofy at times. Dave Windorf, you know, basically everything he owned when he, when he was 13 years old makes it into every song uh, title and every song lyric imaginable. But um, there's some very, you know, he can write some very heavy stuff. Uh, in particular, Bummer on this one has a crushingly heavy riff to it. Uh, the Space Lord was the big hit, you know, and that one's, you know, got, you know, a very loud, very heavy uh, chorus to it, very catchy. So, yeah, uh, people have said, you know, some of their albums are definitely better than others. I get the sense they're, you know, catalog is, you know, sort of eh, up and down. But, uh, yeah, this one it's a pretty fun listen when you're in the right mood for it. It's a little goofy, but it is heavy enough that it seems to appeal to a lot of metalheads. I'm always kind of amused by the number of metalheads that get uh, completely outraged that this band has no entry on metal archives, that, that apparently it's the most requested band to get added to metal archives and the management over there just say, we don't think they're metal. Fuck off. Yeah, so, but apparently <laughs> here, my argument against that would be they allow the inclusion of Trouble's manic frustration on Metal Archives. So yeah, why would you admit Monster Magnet? They have Rush on Metal Archives. How is that more metal than this? <laughs> it's not. I've Metal Archives has always been a little. I mean, running that kind, of, curating that kind of site is always going to be a pain because there's always going to be these bands on the edges of do you put them in or not. But yeah, they, they've always been a very. There, there's definitely a bias to what they will put on there and what they won't. But uh, regardless of that, it, it's definitely a band that will appeal to metalheads. If you've never given them a chance, this one at least is worth yeah, checking out. And it does have some. It will have some heavy tunes on it that you'll probably they had, dig. They had some uh, MTV hits too, right? Like uh, yep, I can't they, remember they, the album. It's the one uh, with like the the fucking Minotaur thing on the cover or whatever. Uh, like, Super Judge. Yeah. I love that record. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Space Lord was the big hit off of this one, but uh, yeah, they, they've 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 flirted, they, they've had enough popularity to you know keep their momentum going despite lineup changes and drug issues and all the usual rock and roll stuff. I remember liking Super Judge a lot um, at the time that it Super came. Super Judge out. is a great record. There's some powerful stuff on that album. It, it's been forever since I heard it. Yep, I should I need to revisit that and that later era trouble uh, type stuff, like Manic Frustration. Manic Frustration is a good one. Good one. That's actually, I saw them touring for Manic Frustration. Oh, cool. Opening opening for Pantera on the Vulgar Display of Power Tour. Holy fuck. Uh, that's, that's a weird, weird bill. <laughs> that's a very weird bill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, cool enough. Yeah, Spine of God. You're right. I was thinking Super Judge, but Spine of God is my favorite of the bunch. I don't know why I got that turned around. All that oh, early yeah. Monster Magnet shit's fucking great, though. Hmm. Is there another is, one with God in the title of the album? Is Sig Sig Sputnik on Metal Archives? Probably <laughs> not. God. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've kind of, after the one uh, with the white cover, I have not been following them anymore. But uh, we made it. Eric, thank you for joining us tonight. It was great. Yes. Yeah, man. We had a great time. I had a, I had a hoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, awesome. next week on Heavy Metallurgy, we will be talking again with our friend, Mr. Mike Seatown. He'll be coming back and we'll be just dissecting the new Halloween album. So <laughs> you want to listen to three old guys splooge about old guys playing power metal 
<laughs> Eric, you you know you'll be there. <laughs> Um, join us. We'll be here Friday night at nine o'clock Eastern time. It'll um, be a happy, happy, happy Halloween kind of night. It will be. I'm psyched. I've been listening. I've heard the album probably a good 80 times and still love it. Have I'm not still gotten for all of you Halloween fans, but man, <laughs> that, is, that is a tall order for me. Oh, so good. Your new store better have it in stock. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add before we pull the plug on this? Thanks to everybody for watching. It's been fun as always. And, uh, Eric, yeah, thanks again. Lots yeah, of, cool of course. shows there. So I'm going to go back and check out some of that stuff. because some months Yeah, I mean, if, if anything, look into the Warlock Pinchers. It's probably the best thing that I pulled. Okay. Um, um, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I want to check out, definitely want to check out that one with uh, the Lemmy and Arthur Brown. Oh, uh, the Captain Lockheed. That album is Captain just Lockheed. fucking killer. Yeah, I got to check that out for sure. Yeah. Okay, That's folks, thank you all for joining us, all 43 of you. Thank you again for sticking with us, and we will see you next week. And everybody have a good week. We'll see you. Peace. Cheers. Deuces. And we 